Iowa has its new athletic director. Beth gets named the new Iowa AD. We break that down. The latest on Caden Proctor, the search for an offensive coordinator. All today, Locked on Hawkeyes. You are Locked on Hawkeyes, your daily podcast on the Iowa Hawkeyes. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, welcome in. I'm Trent Condon, and this is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. We're available wherever you find podcasts, and you can also find us on YouTube. While you're there, hit that subscribe button. Helps us get in front of more Hawkeye fans. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Well, the news of Thursday. Wasn't a surprising one as Beth Getz, the interim athletic director, has now been named the full-time AD. This is a surprise to pretty much nobody out there, though the actual conversations with other athletic directors and there were other sitting ADs that were interviewed for this position uh, started happening in November. I think most everybody felt like this was going to be the path that was inevitable. And going back to last summer when Gary Barta retired and Beth Getz got the interim tag. One thing I said at the time is make sure you get this right. And a couple of different ways to go with that. Getting this right can be looked at, I I guess, in a way that, that has a perception of negativity. And that's not what it was. I look at it more about what Iowa Athletics is. This is year in and year out. One of the top 15, 20 athletic departments in the country in terms of revenue. In the new landscape of college athletics with the power of the Big Ten and the SEC, it's a power two now. The Big 12, the ACC are not at the same level as those two conferences. There are only 34 of these jobs. There are only 34 of the jobs. And just don't rubber stamp it. Make sure that she is the right person. It had nothing to do with her gender. That had nothing to do with anything like that. Her resume absolutely speaks for itself, and anybody that you talk to in the athletics world has nothing but positive things to say about her. So it had nothing to do with those kind of things. It was all about that. Make sure. I mean, you saw what happened uh, just recently at Ohio State. Gene Smith at Ohio State, another one of the top revenue uh, producing institutions year after year with their athletic department, Ohio State with 36 varsity sports. Gene Smith. He's got a lot of tentacles. I mean, a lot of people have worked under him. A lot of people are sitting ADs. And they went out and they got Texas A&M's athletic director pretty quickly. Now, we can argue the merits of him, and that's a different conversation. Certainly not for our conversation here on Locked On Hawkeyes. But that aside, make sure. And they did. And that's all I wanted to see. It came back that she was the best person for the job. The resume is absolutely there. People inside the industry, absolutely. And most importantly, she is forward-thinking. And that's what this athletic department now needs in a new era of college athletics. I was been in a really fortunate spot for a number of years. And in my lifetime of 43 years, we've been incredibly good. It's gone incredibly well. From Bump Elliott to Bob Bullsby and Gary Barta raised a lot of money. There were warts there that came along with it too. But you're going to have an athletic department that is going to look different. With NIL, the transfer portal, those kind of things. You need somebody forward thinking. You don't need somebody that has been in it for a long time, that somebody has done it their way for a long time, and that is changing. Beth Getz is the right person for this job. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, because it's absolutely not. She made one of the most difficult decisions an athletic director has to make. It's one thing to fire a coach when you know it's not going well. In a way, that can be easy. To fire a coordinator, something that rarely has to happen because, well, there's not nepotism that is happening at other programs at this kind of level, making the athletic director the superior to a football coach or any kind of coach for that matter. And to do that in that fashion, as an interim AD, without the full power, wow. Now, was it Barbara Wilson, the school president, that helped push that? 
Were there members of the Board of Regents that maybe pushed this along and led to the firing of Brian Ferentz? But she had to do that at the time. I know Kurt Ferentz was pissed about it, and I get it. As a football coach of any kind of coach, to have that happen during the course of your season when you're fighting for a division championship, you're trying to win a Big Ten title, you're trying to do all these things and have that happen, I understand his frustration. But Beth Getz had to do this because if she wouldn't at that time, it would have got drug out even further. And it would have been, Kirk would have talked about, well, we'll talk about that after the season's complete. That means after the bowl game. And it just would have been pushed back and back. And we've heard Kirk make the excuse of injuries this year, and he would have used it for his boy. There's not a doubt in my mind that the, he would have worked without Beth Getz stepping in and doing the right thing and firing somebody that ran the worst offense in college football the last two years. She did the right thing. And she had to. The timing made it possible because the excuses would have been there. Now, this thing's dragging out. And we'll talk about the offensive coordinator position a little bit later, but incredibly difficult. She did it. She handled it with class. And even seeing that we get the uh, the rundown of all the Iowa coaches, get the email uh, after the announcement came down. And I, I really didn't care what any other coach said, except for Kirk Ferentz. He said nothing but glowing things. He said exactly what you sh should say about your boss. Kirk Ferentz hasn't had a boss like this. Gary Barta was a yes man. Whatever Kirk wanted, he got. And there wasn't a whole lot of oversight. And that was Kirk Ferentz approaching his 25th year as the head coach, approaching turning 69 coming up this August before next football season. Maybe some oversight's needed. The football programs won a lot of games. And as we've talked about here, there is another huge opportunity with that defense coming back and all the players coming back for another season. Yes, absolutely, there is potential for this team to have another great season, even in an approved Big Ten and without the Big Ten West behind it. That's absolutely on the table next year. But a little oversight, not a bad thing. Now, Kirk Ferentz, when he's been pushed into the corner, things go pretty well. You go back to the racial bias of 2020. Went out there after an 0-2 start, ripped off six in a row. Would have been eight in a row if Michigan wouldn't have quit and if Missouri would have showed up for the bowl game. Go back to 2014. Get blown out by Tennessee in a bowl game. Sound familiar? I, the world felt like it was crumbling at that time. They come out the next year, 2015. What happened there? Coming on the heels of 2006-2007. Two, for Iowa standards and what they had done previous, Ugly, ugly years. 2008, by the end of the year, playing as well as anybody in the Big Ten. 2009, they go to the Orange Bowl. Even 2004, after back-to-back -back top 10 finishes, they'd adjust on the fly. When Kirk Ferentz has been backed into a corner and maybe been pushed into a corner a little bit, that's when we've seen Kirk at his best. Has he got one more in him? I think having Beth gets there is a good thing. And somebody that's going to push him a little bit more, not a bad thing either. Beth Getz, congratulations. This is not woke. This is not PC. Just because it's a woman does not make things woke. It's not what it is. It's just those stupid buzzwords. It drive me absolutely crazy and saw a plenty of that on the message boards and on social media. It's not what it was. It was a person that absolutely, positively was the right person for this job, had the resume to back it up, and now she's got an opportunity. Mention Kirk Ferentz in August. He turned 69. Fran McCaffrey, he turned 65 in May. Lisa Burt Bluter, she'll turn 63 in April. Rick Heller is approaching 60 years old. You're talking about some major things that are likely going to be on her plate. And Beth Getz can do everything right with NIL. She can maybe renovate Carver Hawkeye Arena. She can do all the great things that ADs do. But if she doesn't get those hires right, and whoever replaces Kirk and Fran and Lisa and Heller, it's as simple as that. That's the biggest part of the job. We will see what she does. The job is hers. We continue here talking about that offensive coordinator spot. What is happening there with Paul Chris now off the board? Where does Iowa turn? And what is the latest on Caden Proctor? A little Iowa football talk as we continue here. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. 
Today's episode of Locked On Hawkeyes is brought to you by FanDuel. Well, the NFL regular season is wrapped up, but the divisional round is here, and there's still plenty of time to get in on all the action with FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers, you can get 150 in bonus bets guaranteed. All you have to do, place a $5 bet. That's 150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. That's right, just place the bet, $5 bet. 150 coming in to your account in those bonus bets. The app is super easy to use and so many different ways for you to bet. Same game parlays, live same game parlays. Love that. Watch a game for a little bit, see how it's playing out and see if you can jump aboard that way. You can find bets in the new Explore tab and make a parlay in the Parlay Hub. It's the best way to find the most popular parlays that are out there and a whole lot more. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and make your first bet an easy one. Not only that, they already got college football games of the year for next season. That's right, 2024, about a dozen games up there right now on FanDuel. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Trent Connor back with you once again here on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hawkeyes your first listen every day. Your team every day. That's what we do here on the Locked On Network. We got plenty uh, to talk about here today. All right, let's get into the two big football headlines that are dominating at this point in time. What is the latest on Caden Proctor? As we sit here, uh, just flipping into Friday morning, just past midnight, uh, some rumblings that Caden has been seen in the Des Moines Metro uh, doing a little working out here. Stomping grounds, obviously played at Southeast Polk High School on the east side of town. Maybe there was a appearance on the west side of town. Uh, that is some scuttlebutt that is out there at minimum there. Again, I, I don't do percentages. I don't have crystal balls. I don't do things like that. But we have passed this along now for weeks that this has been out there that this has been part of it. And this is not a rubber stamp. This is not just as simple as it's going to happen. Uh, with Caden Proctor did enter the portal. He did not put that no contact order, which normally means that a guy knows where he's going. I think Caden knows where he's going, and it's going to be Iowa City. And something drastically would have to change here, uh, probably in the next day or so, to change that. We know Ohio State would love to get involved. Uh, an offensive line that for theirs. They're certainly, uh, what they're building, maybe they're in alignment away. You know, that offensive line, I think, was a disappointment this past season. You know, they were searching for a long time for tackles last year in the portal. Nebraska, they'll come with a slew of money. His girlfriend, high school girlfriend, plays softball over at Creighton. Could that be a factor? I, those would be the two that you'd have to look out for, I think, at this point. Would be Ohio State and Nebraska. But all signs point that Caden Proctor is going to be an Iowa Hawkeye. It's not official. It's not a lock. It's nothing like that because we don't have that determination. But Caden Proctor, let's say he's at minus 500 choice that he's going to be an Iowa Hawkeye. How about that? Pretty heavy favorite that the Hawkeyes are eventually going to land him. That is the latest on that front and what it does, obviously, for this Iowa football team and this offensive line. It's an offensive line that has struggled even in improvements this year, a long ways to go. Mason Richmond's not going to be a left tackle at the next level. Could he be a guard? Well, maybe he has an opportunity. And I think that's going to be incredibly intriguing to see you know, what they do. If they do land Caden Proctor, he's a left tackle. It's as simple as that. Now, do you put Jennings Dunker inside? You know, He graded out really well last year. He has some struggles. He's not the quickest tackle out there. And there's some guys with great foot speed that get a step on him that he's going to struggle with. And I don't think that's anything that's going to change. It'll get better. I think it can get better. but Maybe inside's better for him, and that's Mason Richmond then bouncing out to right tackle or vice versa. I, I think they have an opportunity, but now the depth that is being built here and quality depth. Let's say it's Proctor, Connor Colby, Logan Jones, Dunker, Richmond. All right, there's your five. And then you throw on top of it Bo Stevens, who started a few games for the Hawkeyes and was banged up this season, Tyler Ellsbury who has started games, Nick DeYoung, who has started games, Cade Peeper, a guy that they're incredibly excited about, Jack Dotzler, another one that's been talked about a ton at the backup left tackle position. You're, you're talking about depth that Iowa just has not had in the offensive line for a long time. Tyler Lindenbaum was great. 
Tristan Wirfs was great. Alaric Jackson was great. They've had great individual pieces, and they've even had great three out of five. But it just never all clicked together. Feels like maybe the opportunity is there. The offense is going to be different. It is. Not markably different. We're not talking about an air raid. We're not talking about the go-go offense, unfortunately. It's not going to be anything dramatic, and certainly in the running game. We saw the evolution this year. We saw the change. We saw them moving away from the outside zone, a play that was just dead on arrival uh, in the new system of college football and the blocking rules now that have well, been in place for over half a decade, and yet still some complaints about it from our head coach. But that aside, we saw that evolution this year. We saw more hat-on-hat blocking. We saw more ISO. We saw more counter plays. And I think that's something that will continue to evolve and get better, coupled with the passing scheme that has to be better because what I would try to do, and, and they almost went into their shell here as things got worse and worse. And we saw the regression out of Spencer Petrus from what he was in 2020 to the quarterback he became in 21 and 22. Obviously what happened this season after the injury to Cade McNamara, and even when McNamara was out there, it was a passing scheme that just didn't work. And when Greg Davis came aboard, I remember looking over at, at the friends we were watching the game with and, and saying, a half in, I hate the Greg Davis offense. Because what they were trying to do with the zone blocking scheme, coupled with the horizontal passing game, it was dead on arrival. And though it got better, and they were okay, and certainly in 2015 they were okay, argue that's more Jimmy's and Joe's and schematically what they did. Brian Ferentz, you talk about some of the great games, but as it started to get worse and worse, they went away from basic tenets of quality football, going away from the middle of the field, rarely taking shots down the field. You already have so many people compressed because of lack of a passing game, and then when you do throw it, everything's within six, eight yards of the line of scrimmage. It's not going to work. I mean, you had route trees where guys are running right up each other's backs. It was ugly. It was bad. And whoever is hired as the new OC, you have to believe it's going to be better than this. And something I've stated before, and I, I think it's incredibly important. Yes, tight ends are going to be a part of it, but it can't be the only part. You cannot base an offense strictly on tight end usage. It's always going to be a part of the scheme, as long as Kirk Ferentz is there and what Iowa does offensively. The tight end is going to be a part of it, and it should be, because those are the kind of guys that you can get. Those are the kind of athletes that you can mold, and they've obviously done such an incredible job of that throughout the years. But it can't just be that. Go back, start at the beginning. Go back to when Dallas Clark was putting together a Mackey Award-winning season in 2002. Well, I said Mo Brown and C.J. Jones. You look back at these tight ends and what they were able to do, they also had good wide receivers. Seal Laporta had 10 touchdowns in the NFL this year. He had one last year in a Hawkeye uniform. That needs to be fixed, and hopefully the new OC will do that. Who will be the new offensive coordinator? Well, it is back to the drawing board for Kirk Ferentz. I don't know how close it was to happening, but boy, there was more than just smoke with Paul Chris becoming the new offensive coordinator. There was a whole lot there. I think they were definitely traveling down the path of contracts, figuring things out. I think it was getting to that level. Was it money? Was it autonomy that he wanted? Was it eventually just cold feet? We don't know. Maybe Paul Chris looked at the job and just said, I want to become a head coach again. And I don't believe this is the right spot to do that. Even if he does improve the offense and he gets Iowa improved up to 80th in the country, there's still going to be programs that look at that and say, eh, maybe the old man's lost something here. Maybe he just looked at it as not the right spot for him. Look, he's going to go to a Texas team and continue on as an analyst this year with the Longhorns, a Texas team that has absolutely loaded offensively next year. Quinn Ewers, both running backs that ended the season as their starter. A couple of big-time receivers. They add Isaiah Bond from Alabama in the wide receiver ranks. That offensive line returns basically everybody. They are going to be loaded for bear. Now they're going to the SEC, but at the most daunting SEC schedule, he's got another opportunity here. Do the analyst work. Live in Austin. Not a bad thing, as opposed to living in the upper Midwest, as we know definitely right now. And maybe he feels his path is just better in that role as opposed to trying to fix what has cratered to a level. Does he look around and not believe that Iowa has the talent to improve immensely in year number one? Or the system just doesn't mesh with what, what he wants to do? We don't know. 
but now Iowa has to reevaluate. And with the playoffs going on, one thing that continues to be out there is there's obviously still eight teams playing. And looking around at some of the staffs and maybe some guys that would make sense. Green Bay and San Francisco would be two places, I think, to look to. I think there's a possibility there that there could be people there. Uh, not only that, not only do you need an offensive coordinator, you also need a wide receiver coach. So those are a couple of staffs to keep an eye on. Uh, there's some names on there that certainly would make a whole lot of sense. Eventually, what happens, though? Is it going to be the flavor of the day? Uh, Tommy Reese out of work right now after Nick Saban's gone and Kalen DeBoer brings his staff with him from Washington to Alabama. I don't see it. I, I really don't. And in fact, I don't see Tommy Reese taking a job, even if he was offered the Iowa offensive coordinator job. Again, if you can fix it, you can't write your own ticket, but you're going to be ascending in a big time way. It doesn't matter if you're an older guy like Paul Chris or a younger guy like Tommy Reese. You fix this thing and make them even better than competent. And that's all we're asking for here is just a little competency over on that side. You're having a big time conversation. It'll be interesting. Uh, what we do know, it's not imminent. And this thing gets pushed back further and further. Would you be shocked if this thing went to February? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. And that's where we are here today. With that, we continue on Locked On Hawkeyes. We've talked athletic director. We've talked football. Let's talk a little hoops in a monster weekend coming up for both the men and the women. Carver Hawkeye Arena, 1 o'clock on Saturday. The second-ranked Purdue Boilermakers come to town. We'll talk about the matchup and what Iowa needs to do to pull off the shocker. Then on Sunday, how about this? A lead-in to an NFL divisional playoff game on NBC. Women's basketball. I just continue to shake my head. That's what's happening. Iowa at Ohio State. One of the most difficult games left on the schedule for this Iowa basketball team. We'll talk about the Buckeyes and the Hawkeyes. Iowa, Purdue on the men's side. Little Hoops talk to wrap things up. This is the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Today's episode of the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast is brought to you by the Game Time app. You shouldn't have to worry when you buy tickets for your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. They have killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. I love the ability to see exactly where you're going to be sitting inside the venue. Doesn't matter if it's Carver Hawkeye Arena, Kinnick Stadium, maybe you're going out a road game, whatever it is, seeing where you are, and that's incredibly valuable when you're going to a place that you haven't been before. See that view before you buy it, and you know exactly what you're going to get when you arrive. Game Time also has deals on tickets right up until the start of the event, even an hour after it starts. It's the place to find last-minute seats. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On. L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Trent Cotton back with you one final time on the Locked On Hawkeyes podcast. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for hitting that subscribe button while you're here. If you're on YouTube, five-star reviews over on the podcast side of things. Always greatly appreciate that. and helps us get more Hawkeye fans here as we have passed the 3,000 mark on the YouTube side of things. A big thank you to everybody out there for being with us and bringing you little Hawkeyes every single day here on the Locked On Network. Let's continue and get into the hoops. Let's start on the men's side. That'll be game one on Saturday, 1 o'clock. Excuses are not really anything that you have to worry about in this one. Yeah, it's going to be cold. It's January in Iowa. Well, let's not get too fired up. Hopefully, it appears that the weather will be moving on, anticipated by the time the game comes around. Now, I know parking around Carver right now is an absolute disaster, but another 100 spots that were taken away as they're working on the new water tower over there, and that stinks. It does. And parking and trying to find a good place to be, and if you don't have season tickets and don't have a great parking pass, it can be a mess. Look, bundle up, get there. This team deserves it. You know, they, they've ripped off three wins in a row, and though they weren't against the stiffest competition, beating Rutgers, beating Nebraska, beating Minnesota on the road, two of those games at home, they still did what they had to. 
individually, they were not must-win games, but they had that feeling. They, they really did. And now they get back to even 500 on the year in the Big Ten. They're 11-6 overall, but they are playing better. They are playing more connected. You know, Stephen Bardo mentioned that in the broadcast on Monday against Minnesota, that it's one of the most connected teams that he can remember seeing this year in the Big Ten. That's great to see. You know, and Tony Perkins continuing to play at a high level. Peyton Sanford, he's knocking down shots. What you're getting inside when both Cricky, what he does offensively, and then the complete game out of Owen Freeman. It's a fun team to watch. The problem, at least for Saturday, is Purdue's just a bad matchup. I mean, just you look at the way that they play. Obviously, inside Zach Eady. Ben Cricky, let's be frank, he's a bad defender. He's a bad defender. And the other side, Owen Freeman, he's a freshman. On the outside with Smith, with what they have with him and Lawyer, both those guys are quick. Both those guys make shots. Lawyer shooting 44% from downtown on the season. It's just their style of play, the clutching and the grabbing they do defensively, it, it's just something that doesn't fit what Iowa tries to do. But Purdue has lost twice this year, both times in the Big Ten, and neither of those games for the Boilermakers were against elite-level teams, right? Losing to Northwestern Friday night, December 1st. Get ready. It was in Indianapolis. There were plenty of Boilermaker fans around for that one. Out of the bars in Indy on Friday night. And you could tell. They were frustrated, but it's not that you could see it coming, but it wasn't a shocker. What did Northwestern do? They scored. Put 92 up. They went 10 of 20 from three in that game. The next one against Nebraska. 88-72 is the final. What did Nebraska do? They were 14 of 23 from downtown. The equation's simple here. What you have to do is you have to go out and you have to make shots. This has to be Peyton Sanford going out there and hitting four or five three-pointers. You need Ben Cricky stepping out and knocking down a three. You're going to need Tony Perkins to have that game where he knocks down three points. You're going to have to shoot the ball well. Getting into the paint against Edie is a problem. And you'd love to see Cricky pull him out, get him away from the rim. Tony Perkins, that pull-up game, stopping at 14 feet as opposed to getting too deep in the lane, that's got to be there. Got to see a whole lot of that. I was going to have to score. They're not going to be able to grind out a 62-59 win. That's not how Iowa wins games in general, and that's not how you beat this Purdue team. Up and down, make it twi- quick, make it difficult, get them out of what they like to do, use more pressure, do the full court pressure, three quarter court pressure, those kind of things, and let's get a crowd in there. You know, let, let's let's get a little excitement going. We'd love to see that. And then on Sunday, mentioned lead in to an NFL playoff game for women's basketball. It's unthinkable. Yeah, that's Caitlin Clark. And that's where we are with this team. Ohio State, really good program on the women's side for a very long time. I mean, they've had a ton of success throughout the years. They've been really, really good. This Ohio State team, pretty talented. You know, they can they can beat you a couple of different ways. And it's going to be tough. It's a different environment. Where they play, it's big, cavernous. They... Going to have a lot of people in the building. Not a sellout yet. One of the few of the season. I think only two games left on Iowa's, not just a home, across the schedule that is not a sellout at this point in time. Still, this is going to be a game where absolutely Iowa is going to have to play at a high level. And when you look at the squad, you look at what you have to do. Again, defensively, you are what you are. Caitlin Clark's got to continue to play at a high level. Now, that's the one thing we haven't seen in quite a while where Caitlin's had a big clunker. And it'll be interesting to see you know, what Iowa can do if that does happen. Got to slow down Sheldon. I mean, that's going to be a huge part of this game and what she does out there. She's scoring in a myriad of different ways, hitting from the outside, shooting 37% from downtown, three uh, rebounds per game. She steals. She averages 17 points per game. So it starts with Sheldon, three players in double digits for Ohio State. It's a test. Is a good team. We'll see. 
excited for it. This women's basketball team, they have given us so much already this season. And just enjoy the ride is what we always say. That will do it for today. That will do it for the week. Though we'll be back with you over the weekend with a little instant reaction to what we see on the hardwood with the men and the women. And uh, a lot to talk about as we continue to wait for the OC. We will have you covered on that one. If there is breaking news, we got you covered as well with that. If there would be a shocker, and Kirk Ferentz would name an offensive coordinator. As always, thanks for making Lockdown Hawkeyes your first listen every day. Also want to remind you, going on right now, Locked On, we have launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. It's called Locked On Sports Today, and it's here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day, with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Have a great weekend. Enjoy it. Enjoy the hoops. Let's get a couple of wins and uh, really have some positivity going in to next week. We'll talk to you again next week. Appreciate your time as always. And go Hawks.